I'm Dr. Howard Koh, and it's my great pleasure to offer a brief introduction for this Harvard Chan School studio event, Fortifying Public Health from the Ground Up, as part of our Public Health on the Brink series. The timing of the event today is critical, as our nation is about to pass an unfathomable milestone, one million deaths due to COVID-19. And at this time, it's absolutely essential to ask ourselves, why did this happen? And how can we assure that this level of suffering never happens again? I'm a physician and professor with over a decade of government experience as a state health commissioner and as US Assistant Secretary for Health in the Obama administration. In those roles, I've witnessed time and again how public health professionals have been forced to lurch from crisis to crisis without the support of a robust system that works. Well, before the pandemic, public health professionals have had to endure a host of challenges that made it so difficult for them to do their jobs. Then COVID-19 came along and made it all much worse. Look at the challenges facing our field right now. Funding for public health in general and emergency response in particular has long been suboptimal, amounting to less than 3% of the healthcare dollar. The public health workforce is overloaded and exhausted, especially since their work is often met with resistance, harassment, and threats. We are losing some of our best leaders in the field, and in fact, more than 500 top public health leaders in the US have quit or been forced out in the last two years. Legislators in all 50 states are debating bills to undermine ability and authority to, to promote public health interventions that have saved so many lives. And last, but certainly not least, we still have too often a patchwork of state and local responses instead of a unified national response. It is long past time to move aggressively to rebuild public health from the ground up to better protect the American people. We need to seize this moment to get this pandemic behind us today and prepare for the next one that may well be coming tomorrow. So I am delighted to welcome a great panel of five dedicated public health professionals who are working in the trenches right now to save lives. I am grateful to all of them and to all of you watching today for your commitment and support. So to start us off, please welcome our moderator, Dr. Celine Gounder, Senior Fellow and Editor-at-Large for Public Health at Kaiser Health News. Thank you so much. Thank you, Howard, for that introduction and welcome to all of you joining us today. As Howard noted, the pandemic has put unprecedented strain on the American public health system, a public health system that has been starved for decades and lacked the resources necessary to confront our worth health crisis in a century. In a series titled Underfunded and Under Threat, my colleagues at Kaiser Health News, in collaboration with the AP, examined how the US public health front lines have been left understaffed and ill-prepared to save us from the coronavirus pandemic. Public health officials have been under tremendous pressure, often facing harassment and threats from the communities they are trying to serve. At last count, over 300 state and local public health department leaders across the country have resigned, retired, or been fired during the pandemic. We've lost tremendous institutional memory and expertise. Over the pandemic, more than half of states have passed laws limiting the public health powers, including mask mandates, quarantine and isolation orders, and vaccination requirements. And last week, a federal court judge in Florida struck down the CDC's mask mandate for interstate travel, one of the few settings over which the federal government has jurisdiction to require masking. Many of us fear that our public health system is weaker than it was heading into the pandemic over two years ago. Today, we'll have an opportunity to look at how we can build and improve our public health system with the lessons learned during the pandemic. And I'm joined by a stellar panel, Dr. Mary Bassett, Commissioner of the New York State Department of Health, Dr. Thomas Dobbs, State Health Officer from Mississippi, Dr. Barbara Ferrer, Director of the Los Angeles County Department of Public Health, Dr. Norman Oliver, who was commissioner of the Virginia Department of Health throughout the pandemic and who stepped down earlier this year. 
and Dr. Maishika Roberts, Health Commissioner for the City of Columbus, Ohio. We've already received some great questions from our viewers, but please feel free to drop any additional questions into the YouTube comments section, and we'll try to get to as many as possible. And with that, we'll jump right in. I'd like to direct this first question to Dr. Oliver, uh, but of course, if anyone else has comments afterwards, uh, please feel free to jump in. Dr. Oliver, you've argued uh, that state and local health departments have been underfunded for decades. Can you describe what that has meant in practical, concrete terms for the work health departments can or cannot do? And what are the top three functions that you think most acutely need more funding now? Uh, thanks for that question, Dr. Uh, Gounder. I, I think all of us would say that uh, public health has been horribly under-resourced and underfunded for uh, decades. Um, you know, with the Great Recession back in 2008, we all experienced big, big cuts in our uh, budgets, and I don't think any of us have bounced back uh, from those cuts, uh, let alone get the sort of things that we needed. Uh, this has greatly hampered our ability to respond to the COVID-19 pandemic. At the beginning of the pandemic, we were scrambling, trying to pull together the workforce that we needed for case investigation and contact tracing and other uh, mitigation measures. Uh, I, I believe that um, what we saw in the course of the pandemic was a house that was completely flooded um, by um, the pandemic and trying to deal with that pandemic. And uh, essentially the foundation of uh, public health has been uh, greatly damaged as well. Uh, we need a transformation of public health and not just plugging in the holes uh, in the house, but really working on that infrastructure, on that foundation uh, for our essential services. And I would say my top three uh, infrastructure kinds of uh, pillars that need to be rebuilt, rebuilt and uh, built back better are uh, data, uh, and technology, our ability to do data analytics, collection, uh, reporting, and visualization, our workforce, uh, which has uh, really been uh, decimated. We need uh, to really improve uh, our training and we need to build up the actual numbers of people in the public health workforce. And I think we need to work on our communications infrastructure and uh, public engagement. Those two things together are absolutely critical for any kind of response in the future. Dr. Dobbs, you have an interesting perspective on the question of funding, and you've made the case that public health could actually make do and do well with significantly less money if only the funding came with fewer strings attached. What would that look like? You know, I've been doing this for a while and, and have realized that we're perpetually um, retrospective, right? We're never proactive. And, and through H1N1, through Zika, chikungunya, Ebola, we find ourselves with pots of unspent money that we're trying to find creative things to do with it down the road while we can't afford to buy uh, treatments for STDs, right? Because they're so horribly siloed. And, um, you know, I've seen this cause problems over and over. You know, a siloed public health system is a myopic one. We're only focused on one thing at a time. If we had more flexibility, I've estimated 80% of the money we would have more than we need, at least in the state of Mississippi, where we could meet the, the, the existing challenges, right? Ch challenges change. What we're funding from a year ago is not gonna be the same thing we're seeing in the future. So I think with a little bit more flexibility, I know it's a real challenge in the, in the recent funding package, there was a small amount of money that was devoted to more flexible spending, but it mostly needs to be that way. Um, real quickly, we, we founded a STD HIV clinic um, that they were cohabitated in a, in a sort of semi-rural area where there's a lot of need. And the funders got mad because we couldn't separate the SD funding from the HIV funding. So treatment and prevention are totally not supported. So they made us shut down the STD function because of the funding. And then they said, well, you don't have enough HIV, so we got to close you down altogether. And so now there's nothing there. This kind of thinking has got to stop. Dr. Bassett, whether we need more funding or more flexibility or perhaps both, how should we make the case to policymakers and to the public? Why should they value and invest in public health? And what would an adequately funded local health department look like? 
Gosh. Um, well, you know, the, the problem uh, is an old one for public health, that it becomes apparent to people when it's failing. And uh, then uh, people are prepared to put money in. Uh, but our successes are often invisible to people. We all expect to breathe safe, safe air, drink, you know, safe water, um, and, uh, and so on. So it is just a plain communications challenge. And um, for a reactive political class, um, it's, it's, I, I really don't think that the problem can be laid at the door of public health for not making its case. Uh, we are an outlier, as wealthy countries go, in spending a tiny percentage of our health budget on public health. All you have to do is look around the world and see what other wealthy nations are doing. So I, you know, I, I'm, um, uh, I, I'm sort of new at the state table um, in this work. I was previously the New York City Health Commissioner, and I'm really pleased to see two people who are, who are, who are from city health departments on the panel. Um, but uh, I have to agree with, uh, with Do Dr. Dobbs. Uh, we, we have to have more fungible budgets. Uh, the state budget is, you know, totally locked and the uh, executed budget doesn't even equal the cash budget, which is some. So, you know, the 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 budget that we have in public uh, may not even match it, match the budget that we have in terms of the cash budget. So these sorts of uh, things. We, we need to have executive authority acknowledge that um, this terrible performance of our country during COVID uh, has to be laid at least in part to the, at the door of a failure to support public health and decide that they're going to change that. Um, I, we just need leadership. One follow-up question to that. If it's not the job or responsibility of public health departments to explain, make the case uh, tell the story of what is public health. And this is really for the entire group and not just Dr. Bassett. Yeah. Whose responsibility is it to tell that story? Well, I'm not trying to shirk responsibility here. I, I, I think that all of us have been trying to make that case and, and, and explain to people what public health does for people. Uh, we are, live in a society that has really preferenced clinical treatment, individual patient care, uh, over the idea of preventing illness in the first place. So we can continue to make the argument. What I'm arguing to you is that it's not a failure to make this argument that has resulted in, um, in the, the threats to our infrastructure. It, it's a failure to hear it. And I, at the moment, I'm not really sure what the answer is if uh, a million lives lost is not going to shock people enough. Um, Dr. I welcome other people to be more <laughs> Dr. positive Oliver. than me. <laughs> I, I, I think it's, it's in large part a, a lack of political will to uh, make public health a key uh, component. You know, the founder of... Uh, uh, the science of pathology, Rudolf Virchow has fa famously said that uh, medicine is a social science and politics is medicine practice on a grand scale. And I think that's definitely true. And that if there was uh, uh, the political will to, to say that this is a number one priority for our country and we're going to fund it, we're going to integrate it so that it's not a fragmented state by state thing, but a national uh, initiative to really uh, protect the population's health and improve its well being. We'd find the wherewithal to do it, I think. I think in other countries, you know, it, it's not even just in well resourced countries, and other countries with less resources, yeah. uh, folks really understand the primacy of, of public health. I mean, it actually. Uh, is the way to save lives uh, on a much larger scale. And investments in public health for making sure that people have access to clean water, to clean air, to clean soil, um, in terms of, uh, for, certainly for this pandemic, making sure that we've got robust systems in place that actually provide people with information to answer their questions, that they have easy access um, to the resources they're gonna need to take care of themselves if they have to quarantine and isolate. You know, th those were all 
um, efforts that uh, really in this country were extraordinarily hard uh, for us to deliver on because there was no belief that you needed a national system of public health that was able to execute at state and local levels. We're not, we're not resourced at the level uh, that this response required. Um, and we've been scrambling for resources from day one, uh, the testing uh, issues that we face, the inability uh, and the struggles to get a scarce vaccines when they were scarce into the hard hit communities where our essential workers had more exposures, you know, continuing now to the distribution of therapeutics uh, and making sure that once again, you know, those who have been hardest hit are going to not be left out uh, of uh, being able to access, you know, life, what are life-saving medications. That, that's all been left to public health. Uh, our healthcare system actually, you know, in terms of the medical care system, failed. Uh, it failed to be able to vaccinate large numbers of people. It failed to integrate testing into routine practices. It's making it extraordinarily difficult for people to get therapeutics in a timely way. You've got to go to three different places uh, often to actually get that access to therapeutics. Um, so, so the medical system was not able to do the response, and the public health system was never funded. Uh, adequately to be able to really stand up uh, to all of that need um, without extraordinarily extraordinary sacrifices, I think, on behalf of people working in public health. Mm -hmm. Dr. Fur, shifting gears a little bit here, you relied on private phil philanthropic and foundation funding to support some of the vital community outreach during the pandemic. Why is it important to be funding community-based organizations and not just departments of health? And what are some of the trade-offs involved in uh, tapping into private funds to support public health activities? Yeah, I think, I think it's a, a great question, uh, Dr. Gounder. Thanks so much. And I, I build on actually what the three other doctors already spoke about. I mean, the first is that the foundation dollars are flexible. Um, and um, the contracting process uh, for foundations to actually support our community-based efforts around prevention are much less cumbersome than trying to, in fact, be able to have uh, a large county bureaucracy go ahead and contract with small organizations that often don't have the level of infrastructure uh, that allows them to enter into contracts with a, a county health department, for example. So the flexibility, the dollars could be used for a variety of issues and the ability to get the money out quickly with contracts that were not complicated uh, was a huge advantage to us. I, I think your, your first question though is probably one of the most important questions, which is why do we need our community organizations, our faith-based organizations, our, our promotoras, our uh, community outreach workers to help so much? And I think, um, you know, one of the, the problems with not well resourcing the public health system is that we have found out the hard way uh, that we're not necessarily the trusted uh, provider. We're not necessarily the trusted voice or the trusted leader in our communities. Uh, and our partnerships with those who already have gained that trust you know, certainly here in LA County has been life-saving. It's meant we've been able to reach thousands and thousands and thousands of people. We have peer ambassador programs. We do door knocking. We take vaccines to people's houses, but it all happens in partnership with community-based organizations that have been in those communities for decades, providing a whole host of trusted services. I think, you know, uh, for our reflection here, uh, we never want to find ourselves in a position where a YouTube video uh, that shows that people are getting injected with microchips has more validity and is trusted more than having your health officer and your health uh, public health practitioners uh, letting giving people good information about the vaccines. We never want to be there again. Dr. Roberts, you lead the Big Cities Health Coalition, which in February reported that there's a dire shortage of epidemiologists in city health departments, putting the pandemic response at risk. And nationwide across all job categories, the American Public Health Association estimates that the field of public health faces a deficit of about 250,000 public health workers. Are we training enough epidemiologists and are they not going into careers in public health? And what other kinds of public health workers 
Do we need to be training? What will it take to train and recruit and retain a new generation of public health workers? Oh, thank you. Thanks for um, having me on this panel this afternoon. Um, great questions and definitely something we all should be concerned about if we're working in public health. Definitely seeing a shortage of all workers in public health. And I think there are a few different issues that are involved here. From a training standpoint, I think public health has gotten a lot of positive attention over the last two years. And there are a lot of students who are interested in public health and are finding themselves either majoring in public health or going on to get their master's in public health. So I think the pipeline is there. I think the challenge we have at local and state health departments is how do we recruit and compensate them so that they want to stay and work for us. I can have an epidemiologist, I can have an outreach worker, I can even have a nurse who can make sometimes double what I could pay them if they work for a healthcare system. That could be a hospital, it could be a private or a public hospital, and they get other perks at that um, agency that I am not able to give them. They could get loan repayment. Um, they could get their license fees paid for if they're working at a private hospital. They get continuing education units um, that as a local or a government health department, we just don't have the infrastructure or the funding to be able to provide them with those benefits that are very attractive um, and entice them to go in those areas. So I think public health as a whole has to not only learn how to train more, but I think we're doing a good job there, but also recruit them to come to the local health department um, where their services are greatly needed. And, and even during the pandemic, you know, where we've got a lot more funding, our total workforce is smaller than it was two years ago. We have well under a half of the nurses we had 20 years ago, right? Um, I think the point of the, you know, competition with the clinical marketplace is just really imbalanced. And so we're really disadvantageous. This is a long-term infrastructure build. It can't be throw some money and solve a problem real quickly because it's just not going to work. And for Dr. It, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, I, I was just going to say it, 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 this connects to the whole burnout issue too, because, mm -hmm. you know, uh, you hear things about um, mindfulness-based stress reduction and all, all these sorts of things. I'm a big supporter of that, but bottom line is, as the uh, APHA says, we're down quarter of a million people. You know, we don't have a deep bench. Uh, we, we, if there's someone out on the front line doing work that, and they're burnt out, we can't take them out of that, give them R&R &R and put somebody else in. There's no one to take their place. Um, and so there's uh, uh, some fundamental work needs to be done to rebuild the uh, entire workforce. And for Dr. Bass and Dr. Ferris, so a new survey found that one in three current public health workers are considering leaving their jobs. <laughs> Uh, to, to sort of follow up on what the others have said, what would be a couple sentences of advice you would have in terms of shoring up the existing workforce and addressing these issues of stress and burnout and retention of our existing workers? Gosh, I'm really um, reflecting on how gloomy we all sound. And, and, and so I, I have to say that, I, you know, I just joined the department. It hasn't been six months yet. And I've been so impressed with the people who are at their posts who've been working, you know, 20 hour days for far too long. Uh, and part of it is that they, you know, they, these are great jobs that uh, enable people to feel every day that they can make a difference. And part of the burnout has not only been the long hours and the low pay, but the sense of um, just excessive political interference in the ability to, to, to promote good public health. And, um, you know, and, and that um, has led up here in New York State. Uh, but I, I think that it will always be the case that there are people who see the mission of public health is one which they resonate with. Um, and so I, I would just urge people to hang in a little longer um, that we can, you know, that we are, I hope, uh, beginning to see some, you know, we had a weekend off last weekend for the first time uh, since I've been in this position. Things are getting better and there really is no job that you can go to where you can really feel that you're doing something for people every day, um, except in health, I think. Um, 
uh, well, I shouldn't say that, but uh, but the the mission, I think, is what will keep people coming to work. It's what's kept people coming to work through these very difficult years. So I have a question. What drew from... me back <laughs> from <laughs> sitting in academia and watching this happen? I have a question from the audience uh, from Veronique, who's asking, can our public health infrastructure be built out in a way that more resembles our investments in national security or the military, um, I suppose she's referring both to workforce as well as other infrastructure, yeah. or is that unrealistic for the American public health system? Uh, maybe we can start with you, Dr. Roberts, and then open it up to the rest of the group. Um, well, that would be a dream come true. Um, but I think as you've heard some of my um, fellow um, panelists say today, it's really the political will. And so do those individuals who are making decisions on budgets have the political will to invest that much in public health? And I would hope that they at least come close to it. Um, but, you know, I, I can say here in my community, we spend a lot of money on our first responders, on police and fire. They get a lot of municipal funding every single year. Um, and if crime's going up, they're going to ask for more money and they're going to get more money. Um, it's very challenging for me at the health department to ask for more money because I'm usually dependent on, for example, when COVID came, we got federal dollars for that. Um, not necessarily municipal dollars, but the federal dollars that went to our municipality. So I really think it's up to leaders and whether they want to invest in that. I think it's an investment that will pay off very quickly, um, but it, it's a really a decision of whether they will and whether they have the political will to do that. Dr. Dobbs, how do we build that political will for public health? Well, it can't be just our voice. It just really can't be. We have got to have partners. And um, we we have found some partnerships in Mississippi around, uh, uh, you know, medical societies, um, state, the state medical association, um, family physicians, uh, that sort of thing. Um, they have some clout that we don't have uh, in, and certainly more money. So that's one of the one of the pieces that's very important, but also other uh, grassroots folks is going to be very important. The way we built up these coalitions around responding to the pandemic and other issues needs to also translate into voice um, because we can ask all we want and it makes a, an inkling of a difference. But if other people ask for us, it makes a big difference. I think one thing that that might be important to note about sort of how you build out this system is I think we learned from the pandemic that it's not just your public health departments. I mean, it is your community-based organizations as well, your federally qualified health centers who have a broader mission that also need to be well-resourced. So I think, I think we should take a broad look at, at what public health needs um, and recognize that you know, the, the, the work we have to do all the time, but particularly during an emergency, is daunting if we don't have partners but we need to fight for resources for our partners as well. And uh, we need to make sure that our partners also have stable resources that, you know, we're not just scrambling for money um, that we need for a particular task or with a particular ask, but that we're recognizing the value of having strong public health partners in our communities across all that we do uh, for public health really means thinking again about how we're allocating resources on a regular basis. If I could build on that a little bit, Dr. Gallander, I, I, I really think that what Dr. Uh, Ferrer and uh, Dobbs just said is really, really critical, this partnership. And we need to think about it really broadly, really broadly. The public health uh, ecosystem, so to speak, is much bigger, much, much bigger than the public health agencies. Um, we, you know, we often talk about social determinants of health and how important they are in, de in determining the health of a population. Uh, if you think in terms of social determinants, then everything from social services, transportation, housing and community development, the agencies that work on that, the community groups that work on that, industry, uh, banks, uh, large corporations, uh, the Federal Reserve, uh, uh, faith-based organizations, philanthropies, all of those people are part of the public health ecosystem, and we need to be getting all of them together, one, to uh, build up that political will that uh, of uh, we must 
fund public health. And as Dr. Ferrer said, not thinking of that just in terms of the public health agency. Yes, we need larger workforce, we need better data uh, technology, we need better communications, so on and so forth. But that's also true of social services. Um, that's also true of uh, housing and community development. Uh, all of those uh, various aspects of the uh, public health ecosystem need more resources. Um, and, and if you look at these other countries, they have national um, uh, public health systems. They also invest in all of those other social yeah. uh, things. And that's one, another reason why uh, they had a better response to uh, COVID than we did, because it's not just about getting shots in people's arms. It's also providing them with other health-related social needs. And we, those we couldn't address as well, or not as well as we wanted. Yeah. So I have another question for the group, um, perhaps kicking it off with Dr. Bassett. Uh, as you all know, the CDC has very limited powers to intervene in state and local public health issues. There's been a lot of discussion during the pandemic about whether the CDC should have more authority and perhaps more in terms of boots on the ground capacity. Uh, can you provide um, some specific examples of how state, county, city level public health departments have found themselves uh, coordinating their response with the CDC? And what's the appropriate balance between uh, state and local with the federal government uh, on these responses? Uh, this is a question that I think is under active discussion. I, I don't think that a federal system had to be lead to such a fragmented response. You have to remember that we had no federal guidance. Uh, that this pandemic began with an administration that was science denying, uh, science disparaging, and we had sort of missing in action our federal public health authority. I used to tune into the World Health Organization to listen to daily briefings about what was going on. So this hasn't been a good case for what it means to have a federal um, uh, public health agency that gives overall guidance, uh, which doesn't have to be uh, top down. I mean, one size fits all. It, it could have been. Um, it, it could have been offered in a fashion that allowed states to tailor, uh, even within their states, um, the uh, their recommendations. So, for one, I, I'm not sure that the federal system was the, the problem uh, here, that it was bound to be as chaotic as it was. Um, but others were, were at the table during this. I, I was not. So it, it would be, I'd be really curious to hear um, what, um, you know, what the others think about this. I, I, um, I, I think we need, uh, we need to have a, a CDC that, that gives guidance. Um, that allows us to tailor that guidance at state level uh, and allows us to go beyond them. Um, you know, I'm proud of the fact that New York State is, I believe, the only big state that's retained mask, a mask mandate in public transport. And we're also the state which is seeing uh, elevated rates. Uh, so it's easier for the public to understand our rates uh, are rising in New York State. Um, but, um, you know, the, the CDC has, uh, has been foiled in that regard. And we're, we're the only county that has maintained oh, a mask yes. mandate. <laughs> so, um, but but I, I think, again, I, I think this issue is, is important. Um, you know, we do look to uh, the CDC for expertise. Uh, and because of that, we think that the recommendations and the requirements that come out of CDC uh, are very important. Um, and they allow us certainly with a large county, they allow us to look at the evidence that they've amassed. But I will say there have been lots of situations over the last two years, where as a county, I mean, we're a county with 10 million people. So we're huge. As a county, we have moved on numerous occasions in a more, uh, in, a, in a manner that actually imposed more safety protections than either the state or the federal government was willing to do. I mean, we're, we're not just a large jurisdiction, but we're a jurisdiction that has significant numbers of people 
uh, who are of, uh, have lower incomes, who live in overcrowded situations, who live in highly dense communities. We've got isolated rural areas as well. Um, this is a, a 4,000 square miles here. Um, and the, the work for us to tailor to the county, I think, is equally important. But I do want to acknowledge how important it is to have a federal system um, that, that pulls together the evidence uh, and allows us to benefit from that. And at times, like a federal, I mean, the transit system is a federal system. Um, mm. You know, people move from all across the country, frankly, from all across the world. So I think there are situations where we were benefiting uh, from having the ability of the Centers for Disease Control to actually uh, put in place those safety precautions, those safety measures uh, that really allowed us all uh, to benefit um, from what hopefully uh, is uh, um, a, an ability to, to dampen down transmission. Uh, and at the end of the day, you know, we can look at our hospital numbers uh, over and over, and, and those are important, but a lot of transmission uh, really, as we all have learned, means a lot of new variants. Um, so we cannot forget about the obligation uh, to not allow for unfettered, unchecked transmission. Yeah. And if I can follow up with you, Dr. Frere, you, you've expressed some frustration with the way the CDC has shared data with the public and the way their messaging about risk on a national level may have undercut your ability to communicate concerns about local conditions in LA. Could you just flesh out for us, what is that disconnect and how that could work better? Yeah, I think uh, you know that disconnect was was as Dr. Bassett noted. I mean, most pronounced under the previous administration. I think it's much less of an issue now. But you know, uh, I, I do want to know how important it is at both the local and state level. I mean, the state and the the national level for for our public health leaders to always acknowledge that there has to be flexibility at the local level, and that um, you know we particularly struggled. I mean, many of you saw. You know, we were uh, a county with high, high transmission at the point that CDC was moving to a different framework. We were instantly moved from being a community, uh, you know, where there was a lot of concern and cause for concern to a community with yeah. low risk. Uh, and that was hard to message um, because we absolutely wanted folks to continue to take uh, safety measures and precautions here. So, you know, I think this, again, benefits from a good communication. I want to give a lot of credit to the CDC team that's in place now for really opening those lines. I would urge all of us to think about ways to create councils and task forces moving forward. This isn't over yet, and we certainly are going to face for you know future challenges that bring in local and state uh, and uh, our federal public health partners, along with some of our academic centers. Uh, to in real time, very quickly look at information and really understand the nuances of the messaging. You know, this shouldn't really depend on people trying to reach out to their connections or the relationships that they have. We should have some kind of structure in place that allows for um, not a sharing down of information, but an exchange of information. So every, so all of us stay well informed. So this is a question from our audience um, that I'll direct to the group. Perhaps Dr. Roberts can get us kicked off. So this question is from Nicole. What do you most hope to see come out of CDC's one month internal review? Which improvements in CDC operations would be most beneficial to your work at the state or local level? Um, so I, I just wanna make sure I'm clear the one month review um, is for COVID and how they're trying to ramp down. I, I think that's what they're referring to. Yeah, so this is an um, out external mm -hmm. consultant, Jim McRae, mm -hmm. who's been brought in to do a review of um, CDC writ large, not just COVID, um, and making recommendations on how perhaps restructure, um, approach things differently uh, with respect to their operations. Okay, great. Um, so I think one thing that the CDC has started to do, and I, I hope they continue to do moving forward is, you know, there are a lot of smart people at the CDC making some really great recommendations based on science, based on the data that they have available to them. But then it's up to us at the state or local level to implement those recommendations. And so I think it's really helpful if they 
give us um, a primer or actually get our feedback before they release it publicly of how will you interpret this? How will you be able to implement this on the ground level? Because it's one thing to write the plan and to say this is what you should do, but it's a completely other thing to implement it in a community, in my case of 900,000 or in Dr. Ferrer's case of 10 million people. How do you implement it fairly and justly for all people, those who have access to healthcare, those who don't have access to healthcare? You know, when you think about it, one of their recommendations um, a while back was you had to test to get out of isolation. Well, for many in my community, that's almost impossible. And it's not because we don't have testing available, but how are they going to get to the testing, particularly if they're still infectious? You know, are they going to ride the bus if they're still infectious? They don't have transportation. So we have to think about, you know, how do we implement it? How practical is it? So I really hope that when they look at all of their plans, they think about a mechanism to engage local and state health officials as a sounding board before it's released publicly. That's one thing I would really like to see, and I feel comforted um, seeing that as part of their plan moving forward. I'm going to echo how important that is, um, listening to what works locally, because we, we acknowledge that state and jurisdictions are very different one to the other. And I understand it's, it's real easy. We do it sometimes on our own when we do the subgrants, is we come up with good ideas and we tell people to do stuff. Um, but that's not the right way to do it. We need to find objectives and say, hey, you're the expert on the ground. How do we accomplish this objective that we're trying to achieve? And too many times we get a thousand check boxes of how you're supposed to do this. And it's and just to be honest, mostly it's 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 a failure because it doesn't take into account the context in which you're trying to get something accomplished. Dr. Roberts, I'll turn back to you with this question um, with respect to data. The pandemic has exposed a lot of uh, limitations in our systems for collecting and analyzing data. And you in Ohio have had to contend with a rather archaic um, public health information system. Could you talk a little bit about how that hindered your COVID response in Ohio and what you would like to see with the next generation of public health data systems. Sure, yeah, so we do have a very archaic data system here in the state of Ohio. I tell people that our data system was invented and started, we started using it before the advent of the iPhone. So if that gives you any indication of how um, outdated it is. Um, the state was in the process of looking at a new model right before the pandemic hit. And so obviously when the pandemic hit, there was no time to move to a new model and we had to continue to use the system that we have in place. That system doesn't allow you to query things um, other than basic things like gender um, and age, um, but nothing else. So exposure, where people were exposed, urban setting, rural setting, um, none of that. Hospitalized, not hospitalized, that was not something we could easily query. Um, I'm a big data person, and so I wanted data for my community to be able to express and share with my residents of who was getting sick and how long were they sick and things of that nature. So it forced my team to have to do double data entry. So we had to enter into the state system so it could be recorded, but then we had to enter into a system called REDCap, which many people in public health are probably familiar with, so that my team, my epidemiologists, could actually give me some analytics that we could all understand. So that meant double entry, meant more staff time um, that could have been used to do something else that we needed for the response, like interview people, interview people faster. Um, so that definitely slowed us down. Um, and we're still waiting for the state to come up with a new system. Um, and I'm hoping we get one in place before the next big pandemic hits us. Dr. Bassett, should there be national data tracking and reporting standards for all uh, local and state health departments to follow? Or should the CDC have perhaps also more power over the states when it comes to data reporting requirements? And if so, uh, how would yeah. those be enforced? Well, I, the enforcement part, I'm not sure about, uh, but the, I mean, clearly at state level, the CDC is an important source of, of massive funding. And so they are funding uh, state uh, health departments who have been their principal constituents. 
Um, and I, I guess I paid most attention to this with respect to data on race, ethnicity, and COVID, which uh, you know were were not made available until May of 2020, even though local jurisdictions were generating the type of data that showed us what everyone saw on the ground was happening. And then the CDC did make this a requirement for filling it, but they haven't enforced it. And uh, we still have a huge amount. I think we only have about 50% of race, ethnicity data fields completed. Uh, like um, uh, Ohio, uh, New York, uh, or at least like Columbus, New York State sort of called into action a, a whole data collection of clinical data, um, you know, on hospital admissions uh, because our data were not real time. And, uh, and this has been a huge burden. It just this past weekend, that they had a day off for the first time. So, uh, you know, we, we really should have a more real-time ability to access utilization of our healthcare delivery system. Um, I would like to see this routinized. I, I think it's absolutely the role of the CDC to set standards. Um, I, what, I just don't, I don't know what the enforcement capacity would be. Uh, that's a question that others may be able to answer but I, I don't I think, know what the answer is. I, I think also like it, it's not just our data. I mean, the lab data. So now yeah. we've got, you know, hundreds and thousands of small labs, large labs. Um, and, you know, um, it's super important that all of that data be going into one central place. Um, you know, on the sequencing, we've got universities that are sequencing and, you know, that data stays at the university until they publish a report. I mean, I'd like to see CDC also be able to, you know, insist that, uh, you know, lab reports are, are also entered into a database that can be easily used and also that we can monitor for quality. I mean, we've had, you know, as we've, you know, dealt with the proliferation of, of hundreds and hundreds of labs here, we've had labs that charge people for testing uh, when testing was scarce and never gave them any results. Uh, never reported uh, to anybody. Um, and it was only after you get complaints that you're looking at a system for actually trying to uh, close those labs down. But, you know, some national standard on reporting and on, you know, really uh, permitting a lab so that we are, again, I think, getting benefiting from the best of the information, I think would be helpful. I mean, obviously, we're in a different world now with, with a lot of at-home testing. Uh, and antigen testing, but there still is going to be a role for us on the sequencing, on wastewater, you know, for there to be both national standards and a national database that we all benefit from. Yeah, and, and a database that allows us to really uh, query it yes. and uh, get, um, turn that data into useful information um, that then gets reported out at the state level and local uh, county levels um, is, is really critical. And, and having a national um, organization like like the CDC really spearhead this is uh, going to be important. Now, it, it raises huge, huge problems, not only of enforcement, but I guess of governance in general, right? How do, how do you get all of those labs, um, all of those academic institutions, all those healthcare uh, systems to put their data into a, a common uh, warehouse or data lake or whatever you're going to use to uh, provide that uh, unified system that uh, allows for the kind of data visualization reporting that we're all talking about. That It's a big challenge, but again, I think it's one that we need to tackle so that we can have a more effective uh, public health practice. You know, it seems just really wrong. I don't know how many of you, but at the beginning of the pandemic, we're looking at Avi's, you know, the kid from, you know, <laughs> King County was compiling data for us from around the world. And then uh, I, I would assume that he was sort of overtaken by a data provision by a private university, um, which I still turn to actually in terms of looking uh, at the current state of data. So this is something is really wrong there. This is clearly surveillance as a function of, of, of the state and uh, should and uh, it, and it, it should have been the CDC to to which this is clearly a role in my view of the of the CDC. 
uh, and one that they're going to have to claw back um, uh, to maintain credibility with, with the world, frankly. So sticking with that um, sort of concept of credibility of trust, Dr. Oliver, we've seen a major erosion of trust in the CDC and scientists and doctors and public health experts in general over the last two years. Some of that comes down to poor communication, but some of that's also related to disinformation that has been spread deliberately to undermine trust. What do you take away as the biggest lessons learned with respect to communication? And what is your prescription for doing better going forward? Uh, well, thanks for that question. It's a huge question, very important. Uh, I think for me, the biggest lesson is that clearly you have to uh, craft the right message and um, that's important. But even more important than the message to me is the messenger. Um, uh, I, I think that those of us who had successes in communicating, particularly to the most vulnerable communities, uh, the African-American, Latino communities, rural communities, um, those of us who had success at that did so by finding uh, trusted messengers from those communities who became ambassadors for the testing cam uh, campaign or ambassadors for the vaccination campaign. So at the beginning of the um, uh, our efforts to reach out to those communities around vaccination in, here in Virginia, for example, we were vaccinating Blacks and Latinos at about a third the rate we were vaccinating the uh, white population. But when we uh, turn to faith-based uh, organizations and faith leaders in the African-American community and the Latino community, and they became ambassadors for the vaccination campaign, we turned that around. We, we're vaccinating Latinos at a higher rate than um, we're vaccinating uh, the white community as it should be. <laughs> and, and, we're, 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 uh, and we finally reached uh, parity with the uh, African-American community. So I, I think it's the messenger having the right messenger. Well, and Dr. Dobbs in Mississippi, you helped flip the script by building strong relationships with black and brown communities, achieving very high vaccination rates among African-Americans. Can you describe your approach to engaging mm -hmm. with and building trust with communities of color and why trust is so important to achieving health equity? I can't agree with Dr. Oliver Moore about the messenger is so very important. And when, when we were, when we first realized that we were having such a challenge, uh, our first act was to put health equity at a, at, a, at a command post, right? It was at parity with everything else that was going on. Anything we talked about, we had the health equity was a voice and a lens that we looked at. But we had a strong health equity team here before uh, working through uh, um, uh, a cardiovascular disease network that we had established as well as other chronic diseases. And so we had pre-existing uh, connections with barbershops, with um, with uh, faith nurses and faith leaders, and other community leaders, local coalitions, and so when we when we got with these folks and we and we worked with them, the first thing we said is, what questions do you have, and what do you think, and just listen to them. So we didn't design any programs, you know, before we talked to them, which I think is very important. And what they said is, we want you, when we call you, we want you to bring a vaccine team to my church. And you need to do it fast. And so we set up all these teams, and within three or four days, we could send a an, an, a vaccine team to any church in the state, and it, and it worked out great. And that's how. And the same sort of thing with community groups and, and listening to them makes a big difference. Um, ironically, we discovered we didn't have those same relationships with the majority population, and we struggled when we tried to reach out to different influencers and pop, part like say like the white churches. We struggled to kind of get through them. There's a whole other dynamic there, I get it. But um, ironically, we found that we had a lot better connectivity with um, dis uh, disenfranchised communities than we did with majority communities. One thing I, I wanna note is, um, uh, cause I, I, I think what both Dr. Oliver and Dr. Dobbs just described is, is super important. But I, I also wanna note that uh, vaccines are not an equalizer. <laughs> Uh, testing is not an equalizer. So fully vaccinated Black, Latinos, Latinas uh, in LA County uh, have worse outcomes than fully vaccinated White and Asians. Uh, poor people or people living in communities with high rates of poverty, much higher rates, cases, hospitalizations, 
uh, and deaths fully vaccinated or unvaccinated. So I also want to say the work on, on health equity uh, is, is way more than just improving access to the immediate responses around testing, therapeutics, vaccinations. Uh, and and uh, I think it's back to some of the earlier questions we were talking about, particularly around workers. You know, uh, our workers uh, who are in our factories, our manufacturing plants, our ports, uh, they never went home. Uh, they never had protection at work. They still have very sketchy protections at work. Uh, and then they uh, get infected often at their jobs. They take those infections back into uh, highly dense communities, overcrowded housing. So those issues around food insecurity, housing insecurity uh, that we've been focused on uh, for decades now as part of the public health work, they have to remain vitally important um, because unfortunately the mitigation efforts that are at our hand, while they're super important, don't get me wrong, you know, being vaccinated makes a huge difference, being vaccinated and boosted an even better difference. But I don't think we should stop our health equity work uh, by just uh, improving our immediate protection measures. I think we have to deal with the root causes uh, associated with racism, marginalization, discrimination, uh, how resources have been allocated in the past. And I'm going to put that back to the trust issue. Uh, people don't trust government because of that. Like it, it's we've in some ways unintentionally, uh, you know, through uh, I think inactions in the past have made it very easy uh, for people who have not gotten the resources that are needed for optimal health and well-being to then not trust us uh, with a message of, you know, just do this one thing and you will be safe. Yeah. Um, so I, I think we have to, you know, really dig deep ourselves. I mean, this is, this is an area where I think public health can, we can do our work better uh, as we move forward. So in the couple minutes we have left, I'm going to try to get through a couple of more uh, audience questions. So if I could ask everybody to keep your answers brief. I'll direct this one to Dr. Oliver. This is a question from Craig. Would you uh, would like to hear about the difficulties with hiring, procurement, and contracting at government agencies due to administrative processes that hamper the public health response? How can these problems be fixed? Uh, we addressed it a little bit earlier when uh, Dr. Dobbs and others spoke about the need to uh, loosen up uh, the restrictions around uh, spending of uh, funds that we did get. Um, and so the administrative and procurement issues were huge problems for us. Um, we were able in Virginia, and I'm sure this was true in other states and localities as well, to loosen that during the uh, declared state of emergency. But once that was over, we were back to the same old uh, problems of taking forever to get money that was uh, allocated. Um, I, I think uh, going forward, we just have to uh, take that into consideration and really loosen things up. Or as Dr. Ferrer did, um, start looking for other partnerships for uh, funding for the work that we need to do. This question is from Grace, and I'm going to direct it to Dr. Roberts. How can we create feedback loops in governmental public health so that state and federal agencies can learn from the work of local jurisdictions? Well, I, I think keeping the communication lines open, having forums that the federal agencies can host and invite public health leaders like myself to attend, having those on a regular basis to get that constant feedback, not only from locals, but the state. I put us all together in the same bucket. Um, so they've got to seek that feedback as well. And it needs to involve the right people at that agency. So the people who can make a change, it can make a difference. So. Um, the leaders, the um, deputies, the assistants, someone who can hear our complaints and actually make a difference. This question is for Dr. Dobbs from a healthcare reporter for CQ Roll Call. What are Mississippi's wastewater monitoring efforts around COVID like right now? And do you foresee the state participating in the CDC's program? We don't have any active sites right now with um, wastewater, but we are working on that. Um, on the wastewater bit, I, I do hope that we can be more forward thinking on it than just thinking about COVID because part of the response is we've, we've always been mm -hmm. responding to what was wrong six months ago. And I think we need to have a more expansive wastewater surveillance that looks also for polio, 
um, emerging infectious diseases because we have pretty good surveillance for cases now. I mean, will we find it a little bit earlier in wastewater? Yeah, sure, but is it gonna be a day or two? Yeah, maybe. I mean, we're gonna find cases because we have a lot of testing. But if we have a new, uh, a new deadly pathogen out there, we need to be able to prepare it to identify it in this sort of way. And I think it's a great opportunity. Yeah. This question is from Daniel. I'll um, direct this to Dr. Bassett. Prevention of disease saves lives and reduces costs to society, but public health competes with medicine and insurance. Can this disparity be re-envisioned? Well, thanks for that question. And I, I think that's really what we've been talking about. And I, I want to thank uh, Barbara for giving a full-throated um, description of the risk we face in medicalizing our public health response and limiting it to vaccines and treatment. Obviously, core to public health is the idea of of prevention and core to prevention is reducing exposure. Uh, you know, the problem with the business case has always been what uh, in New York City we used to call the wrong pocket problem. Um, that the, the, the prevention costs money uh, and the people who save, uh, you know, that money doesn't go into public health. Uh, so, um, you know, that's. Um, this is a conundrum that has sort of uh, encircled our whole conversation, uh, but it, it, it doesn't take away from the fact that it seems to me the most important thing for us to do in public health is always to say that our task is to save lives and that we walk ourselves into a cul-de-sac when we start trying to make the case that the role of public health is to save money. Uh, it just, um, yeah. I guess I'll just leave it there. So one uh, last question for the group, lightning round, keep it as short as possible. What is one thing you wish people knew about public health and health departments? Maybe uh, Dr. Frere, if you want to kick us off. I think the most important thing is that, you know, we, we want to be a partner. You know, uh, our role is is to actually build those strong partners that allow us to take collective action. We can't do anything by ourselves. None of the really big issues we talked about today can be solved by a strong, thriving public health department. That's only going to happen uh, when we have these really powerful partnerships with residents, community-based organizations, faith-based organizations, our business communities. And we've seen that work during COVID. I, I would say the one very positive uh, side of what we've just lived through, the devastation, the loss of lives and livelihoods, has been that opportunity to really strengthen those partnerships and understand that, you know, collectively, uh, we build a better world. But by ourselves, we actually are going to have a really big struggle in front of us. One to two sentences, Dr. Dobbs. Everyone will need us eventually. So um, you want us to be prepared. So, you know, remember, I mean, public health has a prominence right now. And if you want us to be prepared for the future, we got to start preparing right now. Dr. Roberts. Yeah, I would just say that um, I think Mary said it. Oh, she muted. Sorry, mute. sorry about that. <laughs> I would just say that as Dr. Uh, as Mary said earlier, you know, so much of our work is done in silence, because when we're successful, you don't hear about us. But I will speak for myself and so many of my colleagues. We came into public health because we want to make a difference. We want to prevent illness. We didn't want to be on the hospital side when it was too late or in the healthcare side when it was too late. And so our hearts are in the right place and we're here for you. One or two sentences, Dr. Oliver. Okay, going to be hard to do that. I'll maybe uh, three sentences. That's the first. Uh, I, th I think we need to toot our own horn and um, it's hard to toot it about just one thing. Uh, we do so much. Uh, so I would say we really need to talk about all that public health does and we need to talk about the need. I would second what Dr. Ferrer said. Uh, we really need to talk about the partnership and partnerships that are needed to across the whole uh, public health ecosystem to um, protect the public's uh, health and improve their well-being. And last word to you, Dr. Bassett. But I think people may not realize that public health has moved away from seeing itself as a purely technocratic project and understands that if we don't engage with the communities that bear the highest burden of disease, 
if we don't believe that they care about their health as we care about their health, uh, then we won't succeed. So these are, are uh, partnerships that I, I believe really are becoming the way of doing business in many health departments, not just progressive ones like uh, the LA County Health Department that we've heard from or, or Columbus. So there's that and, uh, and a commitment to seeing as unnatural the huge disparities uh, by race, ethnicity. Um, those are all core to public health. If you care about justice, public health is for you. Well, I just want to thank uh, all of you, our speakers, for a really thoughtful discussion today. And to our viewers, uh, if you missed any part of the program, you'll be able to view it on demand on the Harvard Chan School's YouTube channel. Thank you to everyone for joining us today and have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.